It is a blessing to be together today. I appreciate you each for being here. I want to take this opportunity to thank the congregation for your warmth and love and welcome, your kind support, your understanding hearts, your heart for God and the desire to see the church do well and for us to work together peacefully in these things that we have under uh, begin to undertake this week. And uh, I'll be in touch with my coworkers, and we'll be working out of time. I'm not sure how far into the future. They are busy men, as am I, but as quickly as we can to come back in with just visits in your homes. But thank you uh, from the bottom of our heart. Thank you for welcoming the, uh, the ones that I brought with me. I was excited to bring them because I knew how you would treat them, and you have welcomed them as part of your church family, and I appreciate that. We're going to talk some more this morning about the work of elders. We talked about that last night in an overview way. We looked at the work of elders kind of through the lens of the church's mission and thought about those things. And one of the things we discussed in that was the shepherding work of elders. And I want to zero in on that more and spend more time on it because there are certain aspects of an elder's work that relates to uh, the idea of the responsibility to make decisions for the church the responsibility to teach and guide the church. Those things we have a, a pretty decent handle on. We have a decent understanding of those things. But there's a dimension of an elder's work or an eldership's work that relates to shepherding hands-on personal attention to individuals in the flock that there are elderships that are strong at this, don't get me wrong, but that's something I think historically uh, that we may have uh, not emphasized as much as we've needed to. And, and the heart of this study this morning is to put a great deal of emphasis on the shepherding work of elder. Recall uh, the, a frequently visited text for our studies, 1 Peter 5. The elders who are among you I exhort, verse 1, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you Serving as overseers, <clears throat> not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. We've talked about this passage. We've talked about the fact that the, the feeding or the shepherding idea in this passage is a variant of pastor. So this is a work of a pastor, a shepherd, a spiritual shepherd over God's people, and it's, this is a work that's done by an eldership. Peter used the term, I also am a fellow elder, and we read in the scriptures about the presbytery, if you use the King James, presbytery, that word means eldership, that's a group of qualified men that uh, actively embrace this work. We also have observed that overseers there, that's uh, akin to the word bishop. Basically, we're looking at noun or verb forms of that same word. So we use the word bishop a lot today. And in, in general religious speak, when you think of a bishop, people tend to think of somebody who's a ruler over a region. But this passage speaks of these men having authority over the flock that they are a part of. It doesn't reach to other churches, or they don't govern an entire region. This is a local office, okay? So we are mindful of those things and reminded of them just now. Think about this idea of shepherding the flock. We've looked at Jeremiah 23, the first couple of verses. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and catter, scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel against the shepherds who feed my sheep. You have scattered my flock, driven them away, and not attended to them. The King James says, you have not visited them. Behold, I will attend to you for the evil of your doings, says the Lord. The prophet Jeremiah laments the neglecting of sheep. Elders have a responsibility to attend to, to visit the sheep. And one of the things that... Um, we sometimes find when we work with a congregation that has an established eldership and perhaps has had for a long time, these guys get busy. They have lives. A lot of times they have jobs. 
They have family lives. All of those things are important, and they take a lot of their time, and they struggle to find time to just get in the homes of their members. That's a real challenge. And then when you talk to the members and you talk about what do you need and where can we go from here and the elders have asked us to come and talk to you and, you know, who do you see is qualified for in the future and all those kinds of discussions that you have. One thing we hear sometimes is, you know, we just, we just need them to come by our home sometime and give us a word of advice or say a prayer with us. And in the discussion of that, you know, I hear a lot of elders say, yeah, we really need to be able to do more of that. And sometimes as they talk about their work, they talk about there being some people that just have a lot of needs and they're spiritually in greater trouble. And, you know, it's kind of that lost sheep that we read about where they've got to go to a lot of trouble to just get to that person. And it's come to, to my attention, the way, the way that I would word it is, Elderships unwillingly, unwantingly, unintentionally neglect the strong. The members that are always there, that are always in there, they're going to be there no matter what. And they're faithful and their hearts with the church and they want to do their best. Those people hurt too. Those people need tending too. And those people might include other church officers, even elders. And sometimes that gets overlooked and neglected because there's such strong needs in other areas. And I don't claim to have all the answers of logistically how to make that work. You know, we can talk about ideas at another time, maybe in a personal discussion with an eldership. But for today's purposes, just suffice to say, when you think about shepherding, we're talking about a broad scope of needs that involves a lot of individual attention <coughs> that even strong children of God sometimes need. Let's think about the greatest shepherd as the example for our work. What one passage can you think of that describes the Lord's shepherding in the greatest detail in the fewest number of verses? Well, you probably have had different passages come to mind, different favorite chapters. You know, it would be hard for me to predict what all you are thinking of. But I'm going to guess maybe someone here has thought of the 23rd Psalm. It's the shepherd's psalm. This is about the Lord's leading us and his shepherding of us. And inasmuch as he is an example or model shepherd, this is a passage that, can I put before you, this is about the eldership. This is about being a mother. This is about being a dad. This is about being a husband. This is about being a boss. This is about being a teacher. This is about being a leader of any kind. Because it's about the Lord's leadership, and his leadership is an example for us. So let's read this and think about it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's dripping with divine work, isn't it? This passage describes divine work that can only come from God's hand. So if I'm going to look at that as a father or a husband, for example, or an elder in the church, and, and think, how can I duplicate that? I see divine things, divine power that's beyond my reach. So what I have to do is I have to find the human ways that I can imitate that example. I may not imitate some of its specifics, but I can imitate the framework of his concepts. I might ask you if any of you are aware of a musical artist by the name of Bobby McFerrin. Now, I'm not asking you to verbally answer, but as I set that name before you, I would imagine a lot of you would say, well, I have no clue who you're talking about. But if I said something about that old song, Don't Worry, uh, Be Happy, then you would say, oh, yeah, that guy. Well, that guy was Bobby McFerrin. Bobby McFerrin <clears throat> wrote a song that's 
a tribute to his mother, who apparently was a very religious woman of some type of Christian belief, and apparently she was quite a teacher and instructor. And the construct of the song's lyrics is a bending of the wording of Psalms 23 through the lens of her motherly work. Now, you may not like the style of his music, but I think that what he did with that song is, a, number one, a really neat tribute to his mom, and number two, it really says something about how this chapter in Psalms speaks to us about leadership. Mr. McFerrin looked at that, and as he contemplated what that says about what it means to be a good leader, he saw his mother. All right, now that I've introduced that thought to you, I would imagine a lot of you can look at that and you can see your mom, or you could see your dad, or you could see brothers or sisters at church who've been very impactful in your life, and on and on we could go. That's the, the avenue through which I want to explore this passage. And I think perhaps the best way is to just put it side by side and see how the Lord's work here looks like an elder's work. The Lord leads his sheep to spiritual food and drink. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. I've been told that's the only way the sheep will drink is if it's a swiftly running stream, they don't want to drink from it. But if it's still, that that's the significance of that phrase. He's not just trying to paint a peaceful picture. He's trying to say he provides food for his sheep in a way that accommodates how they're turned. Okay, so he provides for them spiritual food and drink. The Lord restores people spiritually to the right manner of life. He restores my soul. It's a relationship that's all about him restoring us. It is a redemptive relationship. His leadership over us is not defined by his desire to wield power. It's defined by his, defined by his desire to help us. It's a constructive leadership. Have you ever had a leader at work that was not constructive? that their leadership was all about wielding power? I think we've all worked for bosses like that. And it's pretty annoying. And that's, you know, I, I hear that expression sometimes, people don't quit jobs, they quit bosses. And that expression is about leaders like that who lead for the gratifying feeling of the power. But then there are those who lead out of a concern and a care for others. And that's the people we like to work for. You understand that. Well, that's how the Lord leads us. He leads us for our benefit. The Lord corrects and comforts even when we face fearful situations. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rod and the staff was not for just twirling and doing tricks. The shepherd uses that in defending the flock, and sometimes the shepherd uses that to reach out and tap those sheep or whack them firmly to steer them to move one way or the other. And from the sheep's perspective, the psalmist here describes that as a comforting relationship where the Lord tells us, you know, through his word when we're wrong. So we don't fear the Lord's correction. We seek it. We welcome it. You understand that? It doesn't become a, I'm going to pout because he told me I was wrong. It becomes a, I'm thankful he communicated that to me in the instructions he gives in his word so I can be more like what he wants me to be. The Lord heaps blessings upon us toward the goal of keeping us in his presence forever. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That sounds like an eternal statement. You know, I, I want to go to heaven and be with God forever. And I don't deny that the passage naturally conjures that thought to mind. But in some specifics of the language that's used there that's beyond the scope of today's study, part of that just embraces uh, the, the word that's translated forever and the way that word is typically used in Hebrew, it embraces the idea of David saying, I want to be faithful to God for the, all the duration of my life. Now, to what end does he want to be faithful so he can go to heaven and be with God? I know that thought's there, but I don't want us to lose sight of the idea that David sees the aim of the Lord's shepherding as to keep him faithful to God through the course of his life. And I, I hope you can see that. And that, in respect to Mr. McFerrin, is a mother's work for her children, a dad's work, a husband's work for his family, a boss's work if he's a Christian boss and cares about the people he works with, 
a teacher's work and elders' work. Look at it. Elders spiritually instruct the church. They bring the church to spiritual provender or food that accommodates where they're at in life. An elder understands what the Bible teaches about how we teach the Word, that there are some that we have to be forceful with. And we have to say it plainly or they won't understand. But the elder understands there are others that we have to reach out to with compassion and patience and take it a little slower and speak it a little more tenderly. Elders spiritually restore Christians in the flock that they serve. It's a constant restorative work. Elders correct and comfort, even in difficult and fearful situations. And the elders' gentle rod of correction comes to be something in the heart of believers that are well served, that is desired and not feared. That rod is not a, oh, no, I got whacked. It's a, I'm glad that shepherd's there to help me, to watch out for me. There's a special flavor to this individual attention that involves a person building relationships with that flock and involves this group of men building strong relationships with the flock that they serve. And a good eldership is a great spiritual blessing for the church. It's not about, we've been over this, it's not about just getting to be one of the ones that votes on what color of carpet we're going to put in the foyer and who gets to hold our next meeting. That's our vision of church leadership. We are so out of touch with what the Bible teaches us. It's not about getting to be one of the ones that makes the decisions. And and I say that because I hear people talk about the eldership in that way. That is not what it's about. It's about being the kind of worker that becomes a blessing to the church. And that depends on the church's cooperation with their leadership, but that depends on the manner in which those brothers lead. And so Psalms 23 is very instructive to the the dimension of servant shepherdhood over the church. Now, I would set this aside for your consideration to do on another day. If you're a mother, take some time in the next few weeks and sit down and really study this passage out and take notes and look up verses about how you do these things as a mother or if you're a father or if you're a husband or whatever other leadership role you may have in life. There's a lot to be learned here about how to lead people. Now, that shepherding then, as we've seen flavored in that song, that shepherding is to be done tenderly. Isaiah 40 and verse 11 depicts shepherding, quality godly shepherding. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. Think back to the story of Jacob when he was leaving Laban and returning to uh, Israel's homeland. And he meets Esau out there, and they come to peace. And then what did Jacob say when, you know, he's like, all right, we're, we're going to part here, and I'm going on home. What did Jacob say about his family and about the animals they had with him? He said, I will lead on softly. I will. He went at a pace that they could withstand. Not everybody can dead sprint, brothers. Some sheep have to be led more slowly. The gentleness and the tenderness of a shepherd paints for us pictures that become bright dichotomies in our mind. On the one hand, you've got the shepherd with a young lamb draped over his shoulder, and the lamb lays there peacefully, peace of mind, no sense of threat, nothing but comfort and care. Because the flock is moving from place to place, and that newborn can't walk with everybody else, so that newborn gets carried. And then with the other hand, that shepherd's got the stick going whack, 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 you know, tapping here and there, sometimes hitting a little harder. That's kind of two opposite pictures, isn't it? But that comes from the same heart. Well, let's sharpen the contrast in this shepherding dichotomy. You've got the gentleness You know of that guy? But behold his fierceness when the lion threatens the flock. And he goes and assaults that lion with all of his strength. Think shepherding David and what he told King Saul about his shepherding work. And he takes that lion by the beard and he takes his knife and he kills that beast. 
and from fierceness then to unexplainable tenderness, he retrieves the lamb from the lion's clutches. He's able to change gears rapidly because both of those passions thrive within his heart. There's a tenderness to this shepherding. Guys, it's a challenge to sustain that aggressiveness that we have to sustain to be spiritual warriors while at the same time being able to be tender. And sometimes people really, really need tenderness. Well, let's think about that picture. There's a personal relationship flock. In uh, John 10, the first five verses, in a context that talks about Christ's leadership over his people and his shepherding work and speaks of his death for the sake of his followers, he said here, beginning at verse 1, Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens. And the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Now, I know this is about Christ shepherding. And I know that Christ shepherding paints a picture of how elders should shepherd. We read it at the beginning of our study in 1 Peter 5 where Peter compared elder shepherding to the chief shepherd. He's our example, okay? Now, with specific regard to this passage, I have read that in that day their shepherding habit meant that sometimes at night they gathered the flocks up to kind of a central area where there were pens and the sheep would be more safe than if they were out there in the wild, even with a shepherd out there with them. And so they would bring their sheep in, and in these large pens, there would be different guys with different flocks. Well, if you're going to sneak around at night and steal sheep, that's where you go, and you don't go through the front gate. You climb over the fence. You get the point of the passage's language. What happens as day breaks? Well, all our sheep are in the same pen. How do we know? <laughs> How can we tell? Each shepherd has developed such a personal relationship with his flock that he can open that gate and start calling his sheep, and only his sheep will come out. The others will stay behind because they don't know his voice. The animals have that capacity to recognize the master's voice. I remember a time years ago I was working in India and we were stopped at a village and there was a guy who had come up with an ox cart. And, I, you know, that sort of fascinated me. That fit stories I'd heard from my parents about how beasts of burden worked on the farms in their youth and, you know, that animal kind of having his chores that he did. So at some point when time allowed it, I went over there and started visiting with the fellow who drove that ox cart. And through the clumsiness of us not knowing each other's language, we managed to figure out kind of what we were talking about. And I wanted to know how he gave his animals commands. And with his mouth, he had certain sounds he made that to that oxen meant turn left, turn right, speed up, slow down, stop, wait, we just passed a gas station, you know, whatever. <laughs> and so he taught me those sounds. And as he would make those sounds that lumbering animal would begin to respond. He knew his master's voice. And I got to where I could imitate his sound spot on. And I made that sound exactly like he did. And that animal just stood there chewing as could. <laughs> he knew his master's voice. That's the kind of relationship an eldership must have with their flock, where they're that close. That's shepherding care. That takes sacrifice of time. Shepherds lead by example. Hebrews 13 and 7, we've visited this passage earlier this week. Remember those who rule over you have spoken to you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. When the heat is on and your temper's about to flare, young eyes are watching. 
when you're living in your daily habits and you're making decisions about things you will and won't do, Christians are watching. Make sure you leave an example worth following. They must watch for danger. Acts 20, 28 through 31. Paul telling the Ephesian elders, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among your, yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that by, uh, for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Now you might feel a burden of some of these things we're talking about being repetitious, Paul repeated himself for three years about this one. So I got a little wiggle room here. <laughs> the church is under constant threat of false teachers, and it's coming from every side. It's coming from the world, and it's coming from other religious groups. It's coming from within. It's coming from without. It's everywhere because it's Satan at work. And the shepherds have to obsessively watch for those things in care for their sheep. So when we look for shepherds, we're, we're searching, hoping to find men that are always thinking, what can we do to help shield and protect the flock? An interesting perspective on Paul's warning to the Ephesian elders here. You know, he's seeing some of those guys are going to go haywire. We talked about that earlier this week. And he's concerned about it. At a later time, he sends Timothy there. Charge him to teach no other doctrine. He's really worried. Go to Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 where the Lord addresses seven churches of Asia. One of them is Ephesus. Find that section of the letter and see what he said about how they tolerated false teachers. I'll give you a clue. They didn't. Sometimes the warning sticks. Sometimes it works. When you've got a devoted, dedicated elder, you know, sometimes they're able to shield. There were other flocks in that region of Asia that were struggling by the time you get, you know, drifting on closer to 70 A.D. and getting towards the end of the first century. There were a lot of doctrines flying around that was really challenging the church. And Ephesus had their problems, but this wasn't one of them. It's like being a watchman. Ezekiel calls to mind the imagery of the watchman. This is a guy who works for a city, you know, and he, he mans the watchtower at night to watch for invading armies that are trying to creep up in the secrecy of dark, darkness. He says, if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet and the people are not warned and the sword comes and takes any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. Those guys were held responsible for how diligent they were in standing guard and in watching for danger. You did not sleep on the job. And the Lord's sending a message here to leaders for his people. For Ezekiel's day, certainly, because Judah suffered from a lack of stout-hearted and spiritual watchmen that were devoted to God. But the church might suffer from the same today if we're not careful. So understand the watchman's duty and that God will require it at the hands of one who is careless in this regard. That means resisting false teachers. We've talked a lot about the teaching dimension of elders' works, uh, of, of elders' work in Titus 1 and 9. They've got to hold fast the faithful word. They've got to be able to exhort and convict. But listen to verse 10 and 11. For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. And that circumstance still prevails today. And what does Paul say the, that these shepherds should be equipped to do? They should be able to teach the Word so well that it stops the mouths of those people. Now look, some people are going to keep talking. But when your sheep stop lifting, listening, as far as your part's concerned, that mouth has been stopped. And that mouth may go somewhere else and go on like a carnival barker, but this flock's not going to hear it. 
So that mouth has been stopped. And that's what he's asking elders to do. There's a reason they've got to be capable teachers that are powerful students of the Word. It is a serving leadership. Mark 6 and 34, Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. Remember the attitude with which Christ saw people. He saw people and said, they need leaders. The church is not just fine without elders. We need leaders. Jesus said that. Jesus saw that. Now, what on earth is going to make a man accept that position of a leadership? You know, should the congregation and those uh, from the outside evangelists that are involved helping with this, should that decision to be made to ask that person to serve, what would make them want to serve? Well, there's a lot of possibilities. Some of them are very frightful. We've talked about this week, that this week. But the one that needs to drive them to that seat, it's not their presumptuous self-confidence or their sense of self-importance or their thirst for whatever glory they might see in that position. It's not as glorious as it might seem. The heart that must drive them there is the heart of a servant that says, I see the need. And I'm going to embrace that, not because I believe in me, but I see the need. And that's the kind of heart we're looking for. That serving involves sacrifice. Numbers 11, verse 10 through 12, Moses led God's people. And this is an example of one of those points in time where he just got war smoothed out with it. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, every one at the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord was greatly aroused. Moses also was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, why have you afflicted your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight that you have laid the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I beget them that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom? As a guardian carries a nursing child <coughs> to the land which you swore to their fathers? Why did you put me in this position? In moments of frustration like this, there were times Moses begged, will you just please kill me and get this over with? Sometimes being a leader is that frustrating. And you know the times, I'm thinking of a time right now where I sat, sat with an elder and tried to console him. He had been proactively involved with his fellow elders and trying to lead a very difficult situation. And someone with venomous words just sprayed all kinds of hateful and lying accusations at this man because he was on point trying to help. And he was not being in any way out of line. He, he is the gentlest of the gentle. And he just sat and wept about, you know, what did I do wrong and could I have done, you know, and it was all focus pointed at himself and he was at this point only through the framework of his personality it looked a little different than Moses he wasn't exactly begging for death but he was done and he needed encouragement to pick up the staff and get back to work and those guys frequently give that to each other that's needed it is a work of sacrifice and I repeat what I said earlier <laughs> What that friend asked me to tell you, go tell them, Dave, anybody that wants this is crazy because it's not easy. But if you're willing to sacrifice for the cause and you've got the ability and opportunity to do so, you can embrace that work. It requires being attached to the ones that you lead. This is expressed in the elders at Ephesus having an attachment to Paul here in Acts 20 as he had been a part of their congregation for about three years and now he's you know, through the cycle of his tours, he's passing back through and he's headed down the road and he thinks he may not see them again. He said, when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all and they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. Now, if it's all the same to you, we can bypass the kissing part. But, 
You know, that's a culture thing back then and, you know, a kind of a gesture towards each cheek. Let's, let's be Westerners, okay? <laughs> I see a real affection. I see God's heart broken because they were attached to part of their flock. Paul was part of their flock. He was part of their responsibility. They had to shepherd him. You think he didn't need it? Read his letters. He got discouraged. He needed help. And they were attached. We see that depicted in, again in John 10 where Christ speaks of the shepherd's relationship with the sheep. Verse 11 and 12, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. Jesus said, I'm here because y'all are mine, and I care about you, so he's willing to die. That's that sacrifice. But that also speaks to his attachment to us. One time I was working with a congregation, and they had a full complement of elders. They had good deacons. They had other guys that were younger that had, you know, brimming with potential for the future. So they are doing a lot of different things to try to cultivate all of these opportunities looking down the road, five years, ten years down the road. And there was a rather young man with a comparatively young family <clears throat> that they had assigned a task. There was this little old lady that needed a ride to church, and, you know, she was getting past a point of being able to interact a lot, but she knew enough to know she wanted to be at church, and it was an opportunity to serve her. And they assigned him that task. And I was standing in the foyer next to one of those elders, and I was looking out there, and that, they had that guy, he's going around here, and he's, you know, opening the door, and he's doting on her, and he's, you know, doing the thing of the gentleman and all those kind of things. And I'm telling you what, any number of people could have done that to free him up for a different job that he had capability to do because this is a very talented man I'm telling you about. I didn't say anything. I just watched. And the elder knew me well enough to know I had questions. Why isn't he going doing something else that he's one of the few that can do and y'all put somebody else on this? That elder said, we're teaching them to be attached to everybody, even the part of the flock that doesn't seem to be so important. In the grand scheme of things, which way this lady turned was not going to make or break the church. In the way people see things, she wasn't that important. In the way God sees things, she was as meaningful and valuable and important as anybody else there that day. And they assigned tasks that sent a message to a young man that said, those people matter too. You've got to love them all. And you've got to be attached to everybody, even to the ones that are a real pain. You've got to care about all of them all for the benefit of the flock. Hebrews 13 and 17, remember this? Obey those that rule over you because they watch for your souls. It's for the benefit of the flock. That's why that attachment must be developed. In view of that great day for which we all yearn, when Christ, the chief shepherd, will call before his review men who have sacrificed and served as elders and all those that were attached to that work and reward them in accordance to the tears that they've wept, the sorrows that they've borne, the sheep that they've sought, the things that they prayed over and labored over. There's an eternal thing going on here, and it matters. And I'm glad you see that. With that, we study our clothes on the shepherding work, or, or close our study on the shepherding work of elders. I hope you'll think about your relationship with the great shepherd and his desire to save you. And if you're not a Christian, he yearns for you to come to him for rescue, and we want to give you the opportunity to do that. Or if you're a Christian, you need the church to pray for you, of course, we would be thrilled to assist you with our prayers. If you'll please come, have a seat on the front while we stand and sing.